Early on, every comic book fan faces that one difficult choice – make mine Marvel or side with the distinguished competition. The competition between the Golden Age icon or the Silver Age upstart has gone on for years. That rivalry made the jump from the colored page to the silver screen in the form of dueling cinematic universes. But honestly, we really watch them both. With comic book movies being all the rage, there are actors who have crossed company lines, playing both a Marvel character and a DC character. So who wore it best? Which actors were more at home in the DC Extended Universe? And who nailed it in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Well, let's take a look. Zachary Levy gained fame as the tech support clerk who accidentally had a super spy chip installed in the NBC show Chuck. Chuck showed off Zachary Levy's comedy action chops, making him a shoe-in for a superhero movie, so naturally, Levy has found himself at DC and Marvel. Levy was an early adapter of the MCU, appearing in the fourth movie that introduced the mighty Thor. In the comics, Thor's best as guardian buds were the Warriors 3, Fandral, Hogan, and Volstagg. The Warriors 3 backed Thor's bad play, attacking the Frost Giants, and went to Midgard after Thor was grounded to see if they could get him worthy enough for his hammer. Levy played the dashing Fandral. As the Thor movies moved on, the Warriors 3 moved to the background, eventually being killed unceremoniously by Thor's big sis Hela. Zachary got the chance to step front and center in his own superhero movie when he was given the wisdom of Solomon, the strength of Hercules, the stamina of Atlas, the power of Zeus, the courage of Achilles, and the speed of Mercury in the form of Shazam. Shazam broke the streak of DC movies that didn't live up to expectations. Shazam stood out with its lighter tone than the other DC movies, helped in large part to Levy's charisma and ability to floss in a superhero suit, of course. Levy isn't the only supporting cast member from a Thor movie to play in both universes. Superhero stories tend to include some characters that are not exactly human, at least in appearance, for the team of bad guys forced into being good ish guys. As the Suicide Squad, that character is Killer Croc. Of course, he's not really a crocodile, he's Waitlin Jones. Joan was born with reptilian skin, and being from Gotham, naturally, that means he had to turn into a life of crime. The sharp tooth, thick skinned bad guy doing good things under duress was played by Adewale Akinoe Agbaje. The Oz actor also played another character buried in effects in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, this time as Algrim, the Dark Elf, in Thor's second outing, Thor the Dark World. Algrim was Malachite's right hand, who sacrificed himself to bring back the Cursed to help get revenge on the Asgardians. As Curse, he had a pretty good run. He managed to kill Frigga and seems to kill Loki, but Loki, of course, is hard to kill. Neither Thor the Dark World nor the first Suicide Squad were high watermarks for their franchises. The Dark World was followed by the tone-changing Ragnarok, and Guardians of the Galaxy director James Gunn is doing a redo of Suicide Squad. We'd have to give Akinoe Akbaje's Killer Croc the nod in this matchup, though. Man, that looks terrifying. One of the longest traditions in superhero movies is complaining about the casting announcements for Batman. That was never more true than when former Jennifer Lopez beau Ben Affleck got the nod to wear the bat cowl for the rapidly forming DCEU. That is until the guy who is going to replace him got announced, of course. Batman vs Superman The Dawn of Justice had a lot of ingredients, but then the deciding factor that puts Batman and Superman on the same side was the name of their mom. Kind of a sweet story for the parent to tell about why two kids stopped fighting, but for the Man of Steel and the world's greatest detective, it was a bit of a letdown. Ben Affleck had already done time in a cowl, though this time as the Dark Avenger of the Night for Marvel playing Daredevil, the man without fear. By day, he's Matt Murdock, the blind lawyer who works in Hell's Kitchen. It was another case of movies drawing from Frank Miller's imagery, this time from Miller's run writing for Daredevil. But the movie failed to deliver, with its strongest achievement being that it was better than its spin-off Elektra. In this, the edge has to go to Affleck's Batman role. At least it doesn't have the awkward flirt fight in a children's playground. Whoever does Hugo Weaving's casting has an amazing track record. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, there were two big trilogies that were dominating the box office, Lord of the Rings and The Matrix. Suppose you've heard of them? What they both shared in common was Hugo Weaving. It seemed like the only franchise to not make use of Hugo Weaving is Star Wars. Well, there's still time. Hugo Weaving as a way of showing up in some of the most awesome of places. 
In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, he appeared as Captain America's deadliest foe, the Nefarious Red Skull. Just like Steve Rogers, the Skull has managed to find ways to defy time and bring his menace to the shield-throwing hero. In the MCU introduction, the Red Skull was the product of early Super Soldier experiments and, of course, the leader of Hydra. This is not the first time he's done a comic book role, however. The Wachowskis followed up their success with The Matrix with an adaptation of Alan Moore's dystopian epic V for Vendetta, where Weaving played the titular V. For that role, V never emerges from behind his Guy Fox mask, but Weaving manages to still embody the charismatic and troubled V despite never getting to see his face. For that alone, the nod goes to Weaving's DC role. Hey, aren't second chances great? On the subject of second chances, let's take a second to take the chance that you'll hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. It's the best way to get around those pesky algorithms and make sure you get the latest videos straight to your inbox. If you're on your phone and who isn't, be sure to turn the notifications on to get the latest. Weaving wasn't the only franchise hero that ended up in a bleak future of Moore's V for Vendetta. Princess Amidala herself, Natalie Portman, fresh off making the transition from indie movies to the Star Wars prequels, played Evie, the woman that V saves and then grooms to take over the revolution when he's gone. V's methods can be a little questionable. V himself has been through a lot like any good troubled hero. Evie's emotional journey through V's program and the pressure of the fascist England that she lives in take a toll on her. It's a fairly traumatic part. Portman has also appeared in What Else? Thor, this time as the love interest to the god of thunder, Jane Foster. The MCU's Foster is an astrophysicist who manages to predict the opening of the Bifrost. Foster slowly started fading out in Thor's saga. By the time Ragnarok rolled around, it was time for the mighty Thor to admit that he'd been mighty dumped. Even when he skipped through time to when Foster and Thor were on better terms, he only saw her taking a nap. The edge clearly goes to DC and Moore's dystopian fantasy, though Marvel gets another chance with Foster when she takes up the hammer in Thor Love and Thunder. At 14, Lawrence Fishburne lied about his age and got cast as a gunner on one of the most iconic war movies of all time, Apocalypse Now. Fishburne has shown up in so many iconic roles that have ranged from Cowboy Curtis on Pee Wee's Playhouse to Morpheus in The Matrix. Naturally, Fishburne has managed to make on more than one appearance in the superhero genre. His first appearance came in the Superman revival Man of Steel. Fishburne takes on the role of the bombastic editor-in-chief of the Daily Planet, Perry White. White also happens to be the boss of Superman heartthrob Lois Lane and Superman alter ego Clark Kent. Sadly, Perry's job is mostly to yell at his employees and comically underestimate Clark Kent. Fishburne got another superhero role, this time as a superhero, albeit a retired one. As Bill Foster, Fishburne played another person who Hank Pym has reluctantly allowed access to his precious Pym particles and got in on the size-changing game. Foster's fascination was for growing, though notably he wasn't able to reach Scott Lang proportions, and Ant-Man and the Wasp he ends up helping the phase-shifting ghost, who hopes to use the Pym tech to stabilize her atoms after Pym technology destabilized him. For Fishburne, the nod has to go to Marvel. Just don't tell Perry, he has a bit of a temper. We feel like you're way ahead of us on this one. Ryan Reynolds sits on another end of the spectrum of the greatest casting successes in comic book movies and one of its most notorious failures. Even the road to success was almost waylaid by one of the most baffling decisions in modern superhero movies. In 2009, there was what seemed like a no-brainer casting announcement. The fast-talking and charming Reynolds would play the fast-talking and kind of charming Deadpool. The only problem is that he played Wade Wilson for most of the movie, and when he became Deadpool, often billed as the Merc with a mouth, his mouth was sealed over. Yeah, we know. Baffling. But then he was cast in the high-budget failure that was the Green Lantern. The movie failed to sell the complex mythology of the Lantern Corps or fit its charismatic lead. There was hope on the horizon, though. After filming a proof-of-concept short, Reynolds and company were able to convince Fox to do a proper Deadpool and an R-rated superhero legend was born. Reynolds' Deadpool was so successful that when he got his hands on a time travel device, one of the first things he did was go back in time and erase those previous bad decisions. Oh, Canada! That chin, those biceps, that cool yet comforting intensity, America's hinder. Chris Evans has embodied the role of Captain America over the course of three Captain America movies and four Avengers movies. It's no small feat. Previous Captain Americas have been less than inspiring. The 1990 Captain America had to be shuffled off to home video. Steve Rogers wasn't the first superhero that Chris Evans took on, though. It's not even the first Marvel superhero he took on. There was another comic book adaptation, however. No, not as one of the evil exes in Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. It's from Oni Press and Fourth Estate. No, Chris Evans was in a different DC adaptation, this one from DC's prestige line Vertigo. Telling the tale of a group of special forces operators, the Losers, followed this elite team during one particularly troubled mission. 
Unfortunately, the movie came out about the same time as the also ill-received A-Team adaptation, and both of them went down together. You'd be excused if you didn't know that The Losers existed or was an adaptation of a Vertigo comic. Obviously, the nod goes to Marvel in this matchup. Evans had a co-star in that action thriller from 2009 that also eventually made his Marvel over the course of three Thor movies. That co-star is the imposing Idris Elba, who plays the Asgardian Heimdall in the Thor movies. Heimdall has the power of the All Sight. There's nothing that happens in the Nine Realms that Heimdall doesn't see. Well, unless it's him not seeing that and move the story forward. But who doesn't have powers that are a little fungible every now and then? At the time that Elba was playing Heimdall, he was filling in time between trips to Asgard with bigger roles in smaller movies, including one where he played South African leader Nelson Mandela. Elba had remarked at the transition of going from playing a historical figure to a mythological one, but Heimdall made it all the way to Infinity War before his final gesture, sending the Hulk to Earth to warn the Avengers of Thanos' coming. Elba had a lot of memorable roles, including his one as Heimdall. Unfortunately, The Losers is not one of those memorable roles. Elba played a requisite explosive expert every good cheesy action team needs, which is neither Heimdall or Mandela. Once again, the advantage here has to go to Marvel, even if the Thor movies struggled to get out of the gate. Josh Brolin, he gets around. From Goonies to No Country for Old Men, he's been in a lot of iconic roles. Like Chris Evans, he's been in more than one Marvel movie, and as more as one character. But unlike Chris Evans, these roles weren't separated by years and years as two different franchises. Instead, he played two different characters in two franchises that were happening at the same time, in the same year. That's some Hugo Weaving level of dominance. As Cable in Deadpool 2, Brolin was able to play the straight man to Ryan Reynolds' off-the-wall anti-hero. As the menacing Thanos, Brolin managed to make the Mad Titan's relentless and cold-blooded plan to erase half of existence to save the other half relatable. It was a double feature of awesomeness for Brolin. Eight years before that, however, there was a much more forgettable outing for Josh Brolin as the comic book character Western hero Jonah Hex. In the comics, Jonah Hex is the disfigured former Confederate officer turned bounty hunter. That apparently wasn't enough for the filmmakers, who instead of taking a power away, they added one. Hex gained the ability to raise the dead for some reason. The rest of the movie hoped that Megan Fox would be enough to draw audiences. It wasn't. The clear advantage goes to Marvel for Brolin. Uh, twice over, actually. And that's the breakdown of some of the actors that DC and Marvel shared. What are some of your favorite cross-comics actors? Where were they at their best? Let us know in the comments, and while you're there, be sure to hit that subscribe button and ring that notification bell so you can comment on more of our videos. Thanks for watching.